Let's dive into the world of a man who, besides missing his calling as a male model, revolutionized the field of psychology. I'm talking about the dashing Gustav Theodor Fechner, whose work laid the foundation for the scientific study of perception and paved the way for psychology as a science. The mind-body problem is a question that has been asked in various forms for centuries. How does this physical entity, this brain of ours, produce the intangible mind? How does a squishy mass of neurons and synapses give rise to thoughts, emotions, consciousness? It's a question that lies at the intersection of philosophy, neuroscience, and psychology. And it's a question that's fascinated Fechner. Fechner believed that the mind and body, though different in nature, were not separate entities. Instead, he saw them as two sides of the same coin, two aspects of the same reality. This was a radical idea at the time, and it set the stage for his groundbreaking work in what we now call psychological science. Fechner was not just a thinker, he was a doer. He believed in the power of empirical evidence, in the importance of observation and experimentation. And so he set out to find a way to measure the mind, to quantify the soul as the dualist René Descartes, who came before him, might describe it. This was a daunting task, but Fechner was not one to shy away from a challenge. In 1850, he had a eureka moment about the nature of the connection between mind and body. And in 1860, Fechner published his magnum opus, Elements of Psychophysics. This was the birth of psychophysics, the science of understanding the relationship between physical stimuli and our mental processes. Fechner's psychophysics was very influential and took psychology from the realms of philosophy and metaphysics and made it accessible to the scientific method. His work led to what we now call experimental psychology. Fechner was inspired by the work of his contemporary Hermann von Helmholtz, who was making strides in the field of sensory physiology. But Fechner wanted to go a step further. He wanted to understand not just how our senses worked, but how our minds interpreted the information from our senses. And so he developed a set of experimental procedures designed to measure the relationship between physical stimuli and mental perceptions. He started with simple experiments, like measuring the smallest difference in the weight that a person could detect or the faintest sound that a person could hear. These experiments were groundbreaking. For the first time, someone was applying the methods of physics, meaning science, to the study of the mind. Fechner was essentially creating a new field of study, psychophysics. Fechner's psychophysical methods were not without their critics. Some thought that the mind was too complex, too elusive to be studied in this way. In fact, there are some who still do. For example, when talking about our conscious experience. But Fechner was undeterred. He believed in the power of empirical evidence in the importance of observation and experimentation. So Fechner developed three main psychophysical methods to study perception. The method of limits, the method of constant stimuli, and the method of adjustment. Each method has its own strengths and weaknesses. Which of the three methods researchers use depends on the specific research question and experimental context. First, the method of limits. This involves presenting a stimulus in ascending or descending order until the participant can or can't perceive it. For example, imagine listening to a sound that gradually gets quieter. At some point, you won't be able to hear it anymore. That point is the limit or threshold for perceiving that sound. The method is simple and really quick to implement, but the accuracy of the threshold you find for any one person can be prone to errors due to factors like anticipation, where your participant predicts or guesses when the change will occur. So they can look like they have better hearing than they actually do. And habituation, where the participant gets used to the stimulus and almost starts to ignore it until it's louder than the real threshold. For the second method, the method of adjustment, Instead of presenting your stimulus such as a sound or light stimulus to the participant in an upward and downward 
stepwise manner. The participant themselves controls the stimulus intensity and adjusts it using a slider or a dial until it's just barely perceptible to them. It's equivalent to turning the volume of your TV up just enough for you to hear it to avoid annoying your housemates. Finally, the method of constant stimuli. This one's a bit different. Instead of a gradual change, various levels of the stimulus are presented in random order. And each time you present the stimulus, you ask whether they can perceive it or not. This method is not quite as fast or convenient for the experimenter or the participant because you often end up presenting a lot of trials that the participant for sure can hear or see rather than just converging really quickly towards their threshold for hearing the stimulus. For example, if you're running a hearing threshold experiment with participants who range in age from 16 years old to 75 years old, and they all hear the same sounds, the 16 year olds are going to hear a number of sounds easily, while the 75 year olds may not hear the sound until it is quite loud for a young person. But because the method of constant stimuli reduces the possibility of anticipation or habituation due to the random presentation of the levels of the stimulus, it does tend to establish more accurate thresholds. Fechner's psychophysical methods provided the tools needed to study perception in a systematic and scientific way. These methods are still used today, not just in psychology, but in fields like audiology, optometry, and even marketing. Let's move on to one of the key concepts in Fechner's work, the absolute threshold. The absolute threshold is the minimum intensity of a stimulus that can be detected. It's the point at which stimulus goes from being undetectable to just barely detectable. Imagine you're in a completely dark room and a light is gradually turned up. At first you don't see anything. But then there's a point where you start to see a faint glow. That point is the absolute threshold for light. Fechner conducted numerous experiments to determine the absolute thresholds for various senses. He was meticulous in his approach, carefully controlling the conditions of his experiments to ensure accurate results. His work laid the foundation for our understanding of sensory thresholds. But why is the concept of absolute threshold important? Well, it helps us understand the limits of our perception. It tells us how sensitive our senses are and how much of the world we can actually perceive. It's a fundamental concept in the field of sensory psychology. Imagine you're in a bustling city. There are sounds and sights and smells all around you, but you don't perceive all of them. There's a limit to what your senses can pick up. There are absolute thresholds for all your senses, and for each sense, the absolute threshold differs depending on the type of stimulus. Right now, if your speakers or headphones are high quality, you may hear a very high-pitched sound being played. Well, I can tell you that I can't hear it. Other people in my house can hear it. The dog next door, he can hear it but I have lost the ability to hear that sound unless it's turned way up, like way up. Fechner's work on absolute thresholds has had far-reaching implications. It has helped us understand the limits of human perception, and it has practical applications in many fields. For example, on product design, understanding the absolute thresholds of sight and sound can help designers create products that are more user-friendly. And of course, designers of hearing aids and eyeglasses they all need to understand the limits of our perception. Now let's turn our attention to another key concept in Fechner's work, the difference threshold. The difference threshold is the smallest change in a stimulus that can be detected. Try this sometime. Hold a glass of water or another beverage of your choice in your hand. Now ask a friend to slowly pour more liquid into the glass. At first, you might not notice any change, but as your friend continues to pour, there will come a point when you suddenly feel the glass getting heavier. The amount of water it took for you to notice that change in weight, that's your difference threshold for that particular stimulus. Just noticeable differences 
or JND, is a concept that is closely related to the difference threshold. The JND is essentially the smallest change in a stimulus that we can just barely detect relative to some other reference or standard stimulus. Grab that friend again and two glasses of your favorite liquid. See, perception can be fun. Fill both glasses halfway and now add more liquid slowly to the second glass. When you notice that difference in weight, you have found your just noticeable difference for that stimulus. Fechner was highly influenced by the work of Ernst Weber. Weber made a fascinating observation, which later became known as Weber's Law. Weber's Law states that the smallest noticeable difference in a stimulus or the just noticeable difference is a constant proportion of the original stimulus. In other words, if you're holding a light object, you'll notice a small addition to its weight. But if you're holding a heavy object, it takes a much larger addition for you to notice the difference. Mathematically, it can be expressed as the ratio of the change in stimulus intensity, or delta i, to the original stimulus intensity, or i, which will equal a constant for a particular kind of stimulus when the change is just noticeable. For example, if you needed to add 10 grams to a 100 gram weight to notice a difference, your Weber constant, k, would be 10 over 100, or 0.1, or 10%. To feel the change in a 500 gram weight, theoretically, you would need a 50 gram weight added. This was a novel concept at the time. It suggested that our perception of the world isn't a one-to-one -one reflection of the physical stimuli around us. Instead, our perception is relative to the original intensity of the stimuli. Inspired by Weber's work, Fechner took this concept a step further. He proposed that this relationship between the physical stimulus and our perception of it is not just proportional, but logarithmic. This became known as Fechner's Law. Fechner's Law can be expressed mathematically as the perceived intensity, or S, of a stimulus is proportional to the logarithm of the actual physical intensity, or I, of the stimulus times some constant. This logarithmic relationship between the physical intensity of a stimulus and our perception of its intensity means that as the physical intensity of the stimulus increases, larger and larger increases are needed for changes to be noticed. Suppose you're in a room with a dim light and the intensity of the light is one unit. You perceive this light as being of a certain brightness. Now, if the intensity of the light is increased to 10 units, so 10 times as bright, would you perceive it to be 10 times brighter? Not according to Fechner's law. In this example, when the intensity of the light is one unit, the perceived brightness might be one unit. But let's assume our constant k equals one for simplicity. When the intensity of the light is 10 units, the perceived brightness would be two units because log of 10 equals two. So not 10 units. So you would perceive it to be twice as bright. Fechner's work on JND and his extension of Weber's law have had a profound impact on various fields. His concepts of absolute thresholds, difference thresholds, and just noticeable differences have helped us understand the limits of human perception. They have practical applications in many fields, from product design to marketing, audiology, optometry. Fechner took psychology from the realms of philosophy and metaphysics and gave it a solid footing in the world of science. His work was the precursor to what we now know or call experimental psychology. He showed that our mental processes, as elusive and intangible as they may seem, can be studied using the same rigorous methods we use to study the physical world.